At the start of May, we kicked off a new series called Battle Ready. And we've decided to continue this series through the month of June. Amen. We feel like there's so much more to continue to prep and prepare for uh, as, as, as believers, but not just believers, but just as people. And, and so a lot of us, uh, you may have realized if you've been here this last month that a violent uh, battle is raging around us 24 hours a day. Paul wrote to tell us that there's a war going on in the arena called the mind, which the Bible often refers to as the heart. And in fact, every person in this room struggles to one degree or another with how we think about things. And Satan knows that he can control us if he can get into the control room of our minds and set up a stronghold. We opened up uh, uh, last month in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I like in the message translation just to find it a little bit more straightforward. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. So the greatest problem we have in life and the most difficult problem of our age is the problem of the human mind. And in the past month, we've talked about how, number one, we've got to identify the enemy. We, we spoke on number two that we must understand the enemy. And then the third one was we need the right strategy and the right weapons. And there's so much material on what the Bible has to say about strengthening our minds, renewing our minds, submitting our minds, and bringing our thoughts into captivity because your mind is is your greatest asset. And so the last two weeks, we talked about four simple principles, and I'm just going to read it through quickly, four of the many for living like Christ and being effective for him. The first one, we said, don't believe everything you think. You know, a lot of times we'll hear, don't believe everything they say or everything you read or everything you watch, but it's really don't believe everything you think. The second one was guard your mind from garbage, allowing the things that we see into our minds can influence a lot of times the actions that we take unseen and seen. And the third one, never let up on learning. We should be people of God that just don't arrive on a Sunday to learn about God, that this is a daily encounter, a daily relationship, that I'm opening up his book and reading every single day. I'm getting into books. I'm getting into podcasts. I'm getting edified every day from people that are pointing me towards Jesus. Never let up on learning. And the last one was let God stretch your imagination. I'll throw a plug in there, but if you want to watch these sermons, you can go on our YouTube page, Revive Cleaning. You can watch the last couple weeks. But we can learn so much about ourselves from every battle we face. And today I want to talk about the importance of growing and moving on. To really be able to lean in and trust God through the battles we face, it will ultimately allow us to move on stronger. Moving beyond the battle, in order to fully surrender, one must first prepare and show up. Battles can be necessary, but they are only a part of our lives. And so if you're taking notes today as, as part of our series, Battle Ready, my message today is just what I said earlier, moving on, moving on. And I'm just going to do a quick prayer to prepare this moment. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to be here. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that, man, you are so good and you always arrive on time, Lord, even when we least expected. And Lord, God, I just ask you, Lord, that you move today in the hearts and minds of people, Lord, that we're able to remove any distraction, Lord, that we're able to submit, Lord Jesus, to you in this moment to be able to hear of your word, to be edified, Lord, to be encouraged, Lord, to allow life change to happen from the inside out. Father, bless all your people, whether they're in the room or watching online, Lord Jesus, that we can walk away different than the way we walked in. In Jesus' name, come on, we say amen. 
Amen, amen. Um, you know, what's amazing is uh, uh, we had a lot of graduations the last couple of weeks. There was high school graduations, and last month college graduations. And so it's been a beautiful time of celebration that has been happening, and, and we're so grateful. I got to celebrate my daughter on her high school graduation, and now she's with all her best friends on a cruise. And, and last night my wife was like, you know, hey, uh, you know, I, it's hard for me to not know where she's at. And I was like, I will find her. I tracked the boat, and I got it here on an app, and I can see just exactly how many knots the boat is going, the wind speed, and every boat that is around her, whether it's a military boat, a cargo boat. I see every boat, the names. I'm taking notes. I'm tracking every single down. I know where she's at. And you're like, man, that's pretty bad. It was just giving comfort to her mother. That's all, but... But what's so funny is that, you know, when we were preparing and, you know, a couple weeks ago we had a, an awesome senior Sunday where we celebrated our high school seniors on, at the youth service, such a beautiful emotional time. And, and a lot of times when you ask people that are, that are about to graduate high school, it's like, you know, man, why are you so excited about this? I can't wait to get out of Colleen. How many have said that and you've been here more than 10 years, right? I mean, <laughs> it's like, I can't wait to leave this city, Right? Uh, there's a lot of history in this city, especially if you're a believer, right? There's a lot of church history. There's a lot of uh, uh, politic history. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of truths, exaggerated truths, a lot of lies, too. There's just so much that's happened in this city that for a lot of us, uh, we'd be like, man, God, send me a way to start over, to start fresh. I don't want to be here anymore. How, how many can honestly say I'm ready to leave this city? Wow, nobody, you love your church. Amen. God bless you. Just the young ones, of course. It's amazing that a lot of times what's kept us here is the community of faith that surrounds us, right? We get planted in a church. We start serving. We, we, we start having a, a, a church family, and things begin to change. And all of a sudden, I want to be here. And it's a miracle when you start hearing people that want to get out of the military and want to actually stay and raise their family here and things like that. And I'm just like, wow, it's, it's amazing. Why? Because of the faith community that they're around. And, 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 and I've, I've thought to myself, of all this stuff, I've, I've been in ministry for over 20 years. And, you know, I'm, I'm now in my early 40s, and, and I I've, I've, I've have a lot of time here. This is my city. This is my place of birth. My parents got here when my mom was nine months pregnant. And so, and she, I could have been born not even one month before in New York where my whole other family's from. But no, we were born here in this city, but God had a plan and a purpose for my life. Thanks. Mom and dad, you can wait it one more. No, no. But what I'm saying is that in general that we have history here. And so what's happened is I feel called to be here. I, I've grown a love for this city. And so no matter what anybody says against it or for it, I'm still standing here. We need people to be a part of this. We can complain. We can criticize. But what are we actually doing about it to help change the surroundings that are around us? It took a small little baby park that I got made fun of for adopting to be put on the news on that small little baby park about what Revive Colleen is doing. And so if you're faithful with little things, God begins to expand and doing certain things. And it's beautiful what God is doing. But I, but I always tend to remember moments in my ministry life of all those painful times, the times I was rejected, the difficult times I had to go through that today, obviously, I can understand why I had to go through. But in the moment, I couldn't. And how many have, have, have it's difficult, you, you hear that song, you see that location, you see that person, and you, it triggers you. Where you're like, uh, right? And we do, we're perfect in Walmart. We're like, hey, God bless you. Hey, oh my God, you're so amazing, right? We all could put the greatest front, right? Because we're Christians. We do it every Sunday when we arrive into the room. We all got masks. And, and, and the thing is, is that it's hard sometimes. And I, and I looked up, I was like, man, how long does it traditionally take for somebody to get over a breakup? A breakup today, right, you know, it's like three to six months, a breakup, okay? You're like, wow, they didn't really like each other. Three months, I'm still suffering. It's been five years, right? Okay, well, hold on. So we got to turn that over to God. A divorce, I saw it was like 18 months to two years it can take for someone to move on. I'm saying that, that literally if you say the person's name, it doesn't cause a reaction, Right? And I was thinking, I was like, man, well, what about church hurt? What about moments of difficulty have happened from people that you've trusted all your life? 
or that you've trusted for those moments. And, and I couldn't find no, 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 like, you know, uh, how long does that traditionally take? How long? I'm, like, I'm, I'm going away now almost five years from some, one of the most greatest church hurts I've ever had to experience in my life. And, and, and still there's moments that when I see something, I kind of go, Ugh. right? And you're like, well, that's PTSD, Andres, yes. I might have a little bit of that in church. Some of you are like, what are y'all getting me? I don't know if I want to start serving. No, 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 no. And I thought to myself, what have I learned about relationships, love, myself, and life from my hurtful past experiences? When you've matured out of it and you've healed, then you can easily say in the moment, I'm going to try to focus on the lessons. If you're mature spiritually when you're growing, that no matter what comes against you, no matter what happens, you may say to yourself in that moment, like, God, hold on, what are you trying to teach me in this situation? A lot of us may not say that. We're like, why is this happening? Like, oh, my God. But when you're already reaching a certain point, you might go, and I'm, we're still human, because you're going to be like, but why now? Like, you know, Lord, like, what? This one hurts. And, and, but what are you trying to teach me? Because our, our first response to this question may be to think of the negatives you may have learned, and it's natural and valid. But try to pause if this is your first reaction and consider focusing on a few positive lessons. Uh, for example, you may think how strong and resilient resilient you may be today. Some of you will not tolerate what you went through in the past because today you're strong and resilient. Strong and resilient doesn't also just mean walls and rejection, right? Where you're like, I'm no longer letting anyone in, right? But know that you're stronger today because of what you went through. You start thinking to yourself in those moments, who showed up for you and who proved that you can rely on them? You start thinking of the things you now know that you don't want in your life. You went through that situation. So you say, Lord, I'm not going to react the same way as they did. Lord, I'm going to learn from this situation. I'm going to treat that person different. I'm going to, if I ever fall into that type of situation or, or that circumstance, God, I will handle it differently because of what I saw. The coping skills you may have developed to face life challenges where now something may come to you and you go... You have no idea what God has already delivered me from. This is nothing. Come on. How many of my spiritual people are in the room that say, you know what? I know what God has already done before. I know what God has pulled me out of. I've seen his work in my life and other people's life that the moment negativity comes, difficulty comes, sickness comes, oh, there will be moments where, where humanity touches us and we don't understand. But there's a moment where you go, God, I'm going to continue trusting you because if you've done it before, He'll do it again. The sense that everything passes and this too shall pass. See, this isn't an all-inclusive list. It may not necessarily apply to your situation, but the idea is to try to identify whatever strength, skill, knowledge, or clarity you may have just gained from a painful event. Focusing on these lessons may make it easier to let go. See, moving on means you're to live your life without thinking about it constantly. Moving on means to live your life without thinking about it constantly or to not think about what you could have done differently or what could have been. See, whether it's moving on from a past relationship, past disappointments, or past sin, remember God has a plan for you. His plan for you is not in the past, it's in the future. Christians are a new creation through Christ. Your old life is gone. Now it's time to move on, to move forward. Imagine if Peter, Paul, or David never moved on from their past. They would not have gone on to do great things for the Lord. We have to set aside the extra baggage. It will only slow you down on your walk of faith. If you're taking a test, you're not going to keep on looking behind. If you're running a race, you're not going to keep on looking behind you. Your eyes will be fixed on what is in front of you. Keeping your eyes on Christ will help you persevere. See, allow the love of God to compel you to keep moving forward. Trust in the Lord. Cry out to God for help, whatever is bothering you. Say, Lord, help me move on. Allow Jesus Christ to be your motivation. What's in the past is in the past. Don't look back. Move forward. Now, I'm going to go into the word. If you go to Joshua chapter 10, Joshua chapter 10, and if you can go to verse 1 through 14, I'm going to read you a story in Joshua and the life of the Israelites and 
all that was happening in this moment, I feel is a powerful revelation for us today. And it says in verse 1, if you don't have it, we have it here on the screen. It says, now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it. Doing, uh, sto- totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had, mu- had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city like the one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Is it Ai? Am I saying it right, Pastor Maria? Ai? Sorry. Sometimes, you know, we don't know preachers, you know, so... It's like AI. We're going against AI. That's perfect. Just the, <laughs> it's the future. I. It's I, right? And all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jerumoth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because I'm a punk and I need more help. It has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. And it says in verse 9. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Harmoth, Lachish, and Eglon joined forces. You see, Israel's been attacked forever. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. And in verse 8, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. And after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Zekah and Makeda. And in verse 11, as they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Zekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. Verse 12. And on the day that he gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Verse 14, there has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now, I love this story because Joshua was to continue relentlessly taking the land And this is after Jericho. Yeah, I remember Jericho. They marched seven times. The walls came down. So they're on their way to their promise. And and, and this is... This is a time where he's saying we need to move forward in faith. We are not to be content to sit back and do business as usual. We cannot rest on past victories or be paralyzed by past defeats. We are to move forward in faith personally and corporately as a church, as a ministry, and as a family. But how does this happen? How does that happen? Joshua was at Gilgal in the land of Gibeon. While there, five neighboring kings formed an alliance and attacked Israel. And just as Joshua has taught a strategy for victory and the solution of repentance, he now teaches us how to move forward in faith. How to move on in faith. Three things he did. The first one was persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. Prayer. We, we saw in verse 6 through 8 that the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because of all the kings from the hill country are joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army. See, Gilgal was significant for Joseph. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 9, just five chapters before, the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt 
from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day, meaning the Israelites who used to be slaves in Egypt, there's a moment where God does something, and I can't go so deep into it. I'd love for you to read Joshua chapter 1 through 10 and really learn about what's happening. But in this place called Gilgal, till this day, what do you think the reproach or think the reproach of Egypt means? One meaning of the word is he has rolled away the shame of Egypt. This means that even though they were God's people and in covenant with him, they were actually still in a position of slavery. They were supposed to be God's children. He had a land for them and promises for them, but they were being treated as slaves. And and, and so for the nation, this place called Gilgal became really important because it was here that the shame of what happened to them prior to this was rolled away. It was taken off. Gilgal means a rolling. It means that something is rolling rolled off of you, which actually oppressed you. It means moving on. So we don't need to let our past failures hang over us. We need to let go of the past and go into what Christ has for us. And at Gilgal, God began to remove and roll away all of the things that had oppressed them. For the Christian, this is really important because because there are things that we have done which feel guilty and makes us feel guilty about. And God wants us to allow him to roll the shame away. And in this risen Christ and on redemption ground, these things are no longer a hindrance to us. So Gilgal was pivotal for Israel and it is pivotal for us as Christians but it is also a place of self-judgment it's a place of the cross it is a place of death it is the place of resurrection we need to judge our own lives first before God can use us now the things of the past no longer hindered Israel God was freeing them so they could now inherit what he had in store for them so Joshua again is at Gilgal his place of prayer, his place where God spoke to him, the place where God had given him direction and plans, where where an angel of fire appeared to him and said, get up and go now march to Jericho. These are your instructions. This is a place that's significant for him. Joshua has learned that he must proceed with the direction of God. And because of Joshua's humility and willingness to seek God's counsel, God assured Israel they would have victory over the five kings. See, God had also assured him in the past of his victory in Jericho. See, from Gilgal, the city of Jericho was only a distance of two kilometers. That's about 1.2 miles away, meaning that the moment they mounted up, you can hear them coming immediately. You You can see them from the distance there's the army of Israel on its way to conquer. And, and it, what the, the, the power in this is that it's so close to this city which Israel had to take. And when Israel crosses the Jordan, their enemies obviously know all about it. And their response is one of fear. They haven't got the heart for the battle anymore because they have heard what God has done. And instantly their hearts melt and they are afraid. And so we will move forward in faith when we recognize the need for serious prayer and petition to God. God God has promised his blessings to those who will seek his face. I love that in this story, the moment the word gets to Joshua that the Gibeon and Gibeon, they're being attacked by five armies. That because of what God's already done, I I know it's just the, the Bible and you read through it just verse by verse like nothing. But because of the victory he's already given them, Joshua mounted up like nothing. He, he already knew. He was like, oh, okay. Mounted up his best fighters, took the army, and went knowing by faith that he was in the right place. And because I'm in the right place, I'm responding by faith what God has already delivered us and said he will do. He was holding on to a promise that we will reach a promised land. He was holding on to a promise that we are free. He was holding on to a promise where God continuously told him, do not be afraid. I am with you. I will give you victory. And that promise is still alive for us today that no matter what we're facing, when I'm in my place of prayer, when I'm persistently, seek, persistently seeking his face and I'm constantly saying, Lord, I am here, that no matter what comes against us, no matter what battle may arrive, no matter what thought may come across, I submit it to God knowing that I have victory already. It's persistent prayer. The second one is extended effort. 
See, in verse 9, he says, after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. See, the journey from Gilgal to Gibeon is a bit over 16 miles, climbing from well below sea level to over 2,000 feet in altitude in Gibeon. Almost 4,000 feet of climbing. This doesn't sound like an easy thing to ask your army to do, especially if you're going to fight the next day. It was a journey that usually would have taken an army three days, and they're going to catch them by surprise. So glad you're listening to our podcast. and We're believing it'll bless your life. And our desire is to impact more souls with the gospel of Christ. If you want to join this mission and want to give today, we will be so grateful, and you can do so by visiting our website at www.revivecolleen.com or text GIVE to 844-462-9071. Now let's get back to the message. See, this was not simply a matter of prayer. Following the petition, Joshua was on the move all night long. He extends tremendous effort. He avoided the pitfall of attempting this in his own strength by spending time with God. However, he also realized that he could not sit back and wait for things to happen. And sometimes the thing that holds us back from taking the promised land is fear. We don't want to head in the direction God's pointing us because we're afraid. We'll never get there if we never go. See, the battle gets stronger. If you think the battles you face will just get easier in time, think again. If you are a person who is growing in the Lord and beginning to acquire more and more of the promised land, you will find that the battle only gets worse. (laughs) You know, I've mentioned a lot that when God is going to do something wonderful, you may start with a hardship. And when God is going to do something amazing, you may start with an impossibility. The more you grow in the Lord, the more useful you are to him, and the more the enemy will want to destroy you. If you stay lukewarm and just feel content to sit on the sidelines, you will find that the battle isn't all that bad, but you're also probably pretty miserable having a taste of what God has for you, yet never possessing it for yourself. It starts off when you decide you want to get serious for the Lord, and so you begin to take a stand against areas in your life that aren't pleasing to the Lord, and that battle... Can be, that can be a battle for sure. See, as you begin to grow in the Lord, you find that God is able to use you. And you eventually begin to develop your own ministry of sorts. And it may be getting the coffee ready for Sunday morning. It may be cleaning the church. It may be having a small group, meeting your home. Or you'll find that as soon as you step out to be used by the Lord, you will face opposition. But if you learn to stick it out and fight, you will find that you can handle the opposition. You find that You want to be used more so you open yourself up to more opportunities to minister to others. You know, I'm I'm so proud of of Tabitha and her family. And I know they're here. Where y'all at? Where's that spotlight fam? You know, that was pretty awesome yesterday. I I pray God always give me patience to sit through a recital. It's hard. No, no, I love y'all. I'm so talented. But what's beautiful about their story, and you've heard the testimony a lot of times, is that a lot of them came from an invitation from my sister and her family and because my, my niece was part of their dance company. And, and, and they've arrived and God saved them and, and they've been involved. In, but the beauty of the change that we get to see that sometimes it's hard to measure because a lot of people respond to altar call, but it's hard to really get some, to be a part of community. And, and so they, they think to themselves in that moment, they'll go, how do I get part of something and it's been beautiful to watch their family begin to get involved and be a part of a community of faith and all of a sudden things begin to happen where they feel a part of something they feel that they're family with people that don't know them that are not part of them that have they've never met before if something begins to happen when I open myself up to begin to serve God and you cannot stay on the sidelines by yourself Thinking that you can push forward in this life so simply, saying, I got this, I'm able to do, I really don't need that, I I don't want to get planted anywhere, I don't, I don't need, I'm I'm good, I know God, I'm spiritual, he hears me, I talk to him, I seek him, this and that, but what are you doing to build up his church? What are you doing to continue to be in community with others? And, And some people will take it in today, what I'm saying is manipulation and say, you just want me to serve and do your agenda and things like that, well, that means you're operating from a state of offense and hurt of something that has happened in the past, but you're not doing it for me, you're doing it for God, and and 
And the beauty of a, a church like this that's imperfect is what I'm looking for is fruit and health. We may not have all the great things a church may have, but I'm standing in a healthy church. Well, I'm not afraid to be open. And you may think, so oh, Andres, any preacher could say that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But we didn't, have, we didn't go through what we had to go through to not be healthy today. God allowed us to face some things in our life to understand that this does not belong to us. That revive does not belong to me or my parents. That you don't belong to us. We don't own you. We are called to serve you. We're here to uplift you. We're here to pull out the best that's inside of you. God, continue to impact my life, to look at people for their heart and not their gift. Lord, continue to impact my life, to be humble enough to say it's okay. God still loves you even though you can no longer do something for me. That God, continue to do a work in us to remind me of where I don't want to be or what I've had to face in my life and to look at people as God's people not my people. I don't want anybody going out here saying, I go to the best church. No, no. You go to the best church that's for you and that helps you grow. We are not the best church. We are part of his kingdom. We're part of his global church. This is not a competition with other churches. This is not a competition of who does it better. We're about to launch a young adult ministry and already the enemy wants to attack because of what we're declaring as presence over production, what God is doing in this place, people are tired of the same thing. They're seeking after his face, and we're saying, God, we just want to make room for you. It all belongs to you. We want people to encounter you. What happens? People get on their high mic, like, no, nah, you know, Y'all attacking us. No, we're not. We're not even looking anywhere else. Can I tell you that I do not look at any other church in this city to see what's happening? Put that on because I know you're watching. We are not looking at any other church to see what's happening. I'm not trying to see what someone else is doing. We are being intentional to say, God, what do you want from this house? What do you want with what you've placed in our hands? God, I don't want this mental battle to say, if I do it like this, we'll lose this. If I do it like this, we'll gain this. God, it's all about you. It's always about you. If there's five or 500, it's always about you. You can take it away today because it's not about me. And God is doing a humbling in the work of the church. And if you're here for the first time, I'm sorry that you're hearing this. Yes, there's politics in church. And it's a sad thing. Why? Because we're human. And there's humanity that's involved with submitting themselves to God to do his work. So sometimes my humanity gets in the way. And all God wants is people to humble themselves and say it's about his kingdom. Not about my kingdom. Man, when we started Revive, the first thing we said is, God, if it does not become, if the moment it becomes about me, take me out. When it becomes about me, take me out, Lord. Like that, it's an immediate spirit moment that says, Andres, you better be careful. Because we will all have it. We're like, oh, I'm very proud of what God's doing here. I'm very proud to rep revive. I'm proud of my people. I'm proud there's people in this room that will cut somebody for us, and we don't want y'all to do that. <laughs> I'm proud to come to this church. I'm proud to see what God is building here. I'm proud to see people's lives change. I'm proud to see marriages restored and proud of teenagers being on fire for God. I'm proud of those things, so we're going to talk about it, but I'm going to celebrate what else God is doing. If you're looking for a church and it's your first time, I need you to understand, you have to look at fruit because we will always show you the best on our social media. We'll always show you what looks great. We, we will fall into that. We just show you, like, make sure you put that one, this and that. Don't show empty chairs. Don't show, you know, make sure it's, it. why do we do that, right? Because we want to show something, a, a, a thing to, to attract people to come and just, man, when we changed that up last year, said forget all that stuff. Just, just, just show people in the presence of God. Just, just talk about, let's use it as a tool to minister to others. Let's just take moments where people can take it and be like, wow, that applies to me. That's edified my life. And so I, I'm going to take that with extended effort. I'm going to say, God, I, I'm here for you. So if, if Joshua can march all night, I'm not going to allow nothing to stop us from moving forward to occupy 
occupy, what you have placed, no matter what opposition comes, no matter what's coming against me, no matter what's being whispered elsewhere, God, you are here, you're for us, and you've shown it time and time again. So don't be surprised when you step out and you face more opposition. It's normal. Right, Alicia? It's normal. I told Alicia Milton, I said, welcome to high capacity ministry. Victory for believers comes when we depend on God in prayer and then prepare ourselves and extend the effort. My final point is provided power. It says in verse 12 and 14, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. See, as Joshua was running out of daylight, God intervened. He lengthened the day and shortened the night because the people of God followed his plan. It says in Romans 8.37, if God is for us, who can be against us? The God who fought for Israel enables us to face all that comes our way. By his power, we are more than conquerors. I I love how I said that. He lengthened the day and shortened the night because the people of God followed his plan. You know, as as we've been declaring and believing for the last couple years that God... We don't know what's in his plans. Like we have a full house today, and it's so beautiful seeing everyone's faces and families here. And, and we think to ourselves, Lord, we're not going to fit in here. We've had moments where we've had to put out chairs, and, and it's all glory to God. But, but God, we're, we're good on a Sunday. Maybe we can add a service. But, man, Lord, we're, we feel tight in our kids' room. We, 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 there's ministry happening every day in this church, and the resources as far as facilities-wise is, is small. It's, it's hard to do ministry when you're dreaming for something big with what we have. And so what have we done? We said, God, we're just going to be faithful with what you have. We're, we're going to be aggressive, saving us as a church, and, and we're going to allow God to just lead us. And, and something that Pastor said this morning is that in our second phase as a church, we're believing that, that the, the church right next to us, see, this is not owned by us. It's owned by the church right next to us, the Korean church, phenomenal pastors there. And, and we're going to be meeting with them here in the next couple of weeks where we potentially will be able to take over the entire complex. Just keep that in prayer as a church member here with us. Because that will allow us to have more room for our kids over there. That will allow us to expand and be able to do things with offices over there. That will allow us to, to do ministry at a different level in our, in, in our, in our Bible university that's here and in, in our different arts ministries and, and all the different things that happen every single day in this church. But we have to step out of faith. And we have to believe that victory is for those that come when we depend in God in prayer and we prepare ourselves and extend the effort. See, as Joshua was running out of daylight, God intervened and I shared that with you earlier about the building is because we can get into our minds and be like, Lord, we don't know what to do. Like, God, we, like, oh my God, we don't fit. And it's easy. In a staff meeting, you can hear tons of complaints naturally because we're talking about what the challenges are. Man, we're challenged with this. Man, we're struggling with this. Man, we didn't fit with this. Man, we had over too many of this. And, we had, and we're like, man, Lord, these are great growing problems. We're going through growing pain. And, and we're thinking about this. And see, I, I heard it this way one time. A lot of times preachers and pastors can be so excited about saying, come as you are. Be a part of this. This is a hospital, right? This is a place for you. And, and, and we're excited about growth, right? Because and sometimes we're more excited about labor and delivery, but really we still have to take care of that baby and sustain it. I, I can get excited about just delivering it, putting labor, pushing this thing out, and really seeing it, but, but really ministry is sustaining it and taking care of it. And some people get their hands off of it. It's already there. It's yours. And no, no, no. I still have to be there to help contain it, grow it, and, and push it, and, 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 and do different things to help with what you've placed in our hands. I've come to realize that, Lord, man, if you stopped the sun for Joshua, no matter what we're going through in this growth, 
God, you're going to make a way. His word says, draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. He'll draw near to my problems, draw near to my challenges. Draw. He didn't say, uh, you know, uh, just specific, no, no, draw near to him. God, you got this. What's the situation in your life, in your family? What is it that you're focusing on every day that you're pondering on in your mind? What's the battle? And God is saying, draw near to me. He can stop the sun. And, and here's the beauty is that nothing is impossible for God. And as a kid growing up, there wasn't anything my dad couldn't do, but I grew up, and as I grew up, I realized that my dad is only human. And you outgrow the idea that dad can do anything, but the idea that God can do anything is something we should never think we can outgrow. What kind of situations are you facing? Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Isaiah 43, 18 says, forget what happened in the past and do not dwell on events from long ago. It's time to move on. Another word for moving on is go, walk, run, glide, travel, drift, budge, stir, shift, pass, cross, row. I just copy pasted it from, you know, the different synonyms. But Philippians 3, 13 says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. As, as we put on the full armor of God, as we renew our minds and we realize that this battle is not with flesh and blood, I move forward straining forward to what lies ahead. What lies ahead, I don't, I don't know specifically. But fixing my eyes on him. And when I fix my eyes on him, he starts revealing certain things. He starts opening certain things. He starts sharing certain things. He starts opening up things in me that I thought were never there. And all of a sudden, I, my faith grows and, and, and I start dreaming again. And things begin to get revived in me to say, you know what? We're going to believe that we're going to have that building. Because in phase three of a church, we're building a building. And God's going to make it happen. And, and it's not just for us. God's doing it because he wants to expand his kingdom. We just want to be obedient. Be tools for him. See, don't let yesterday use up too much of today. Sometimes God closes doors because it's time to move on. He knows you won't move unless your circumstances force you. And you can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. See, I close with this, that always remember that your identity is not found in your past. It's found in Christ. Just calm down for a second and be still. Don't dwell on the negative, which can result in depression. Instead, change your focus to Christ and reflect on his goodness and his love for you. Get alone with him and pray that he comforts your heart. Get up and let's move on from the past. To be battle ready, I have to learn to move on. And move on for you may be letting go of something. Move on for you may be moving forward to something. So I want to take a moment right now. We're going to pray. If you can stand to your feet and we're going to close out. So Father, we just come to you in this moment. I'll give you thanks for your message. Give you thanks for a reminder, Lord Jesus, that man, just as you told Joshua, do not be afraid. I'm with you. That you already have victory. You've reminded us today to trust in you, Lord, to be battle ready. I have to learn to move on. I have to learn to move forward. To take hold of what you've placed in my hands, what I've let go of the past because of situations, hurt, pain. Today we want to choose you, God. We want to walk the path that you've placed before us. We want you to guide our steps. We want to move forward right now. Touch every heart, every mind, Lord, that ponders on whatever may be taking their thoughts at night or in this moment, to be able to let go. But as we continue to learn about renewing our minds, Father, that in this moment right now, we're able to submit to you and say, God, 
Have your way. Have your way in my life. Have your way in my thoughts, Lord. Have your way in my relationship. Have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. See, I believe that you have grown from the past. You have learned from the situation. And now God can use the situation for his glory. See, what happened to you yesterday does not dictate what is going to happen to you tomorrow. If you have to move step by step, then move step by step. See, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. Do not ask God to guide your footsteps if you're not willing to move your feet. The battle has already been won. That's why Joshua had such confidence to know that I'm about to go up against five armies. But I come with the army of God. Greater is he that is within me than he that is in this world. Meaning it doesn't matter how heavy, how painful, or how it may look right now. I'm willing to focus my energy on building the new. So when we talked about the armor of God in the first week, we didn't talk about that armor is to put on to go out and start slaying demons and dragons. And No, it's to put on to be able to resist. To be able to say, no matter what comes against me, I stand firm. And be able to, to occupy the land. To know that no matter what happens, the promise is before me and God never breaks a promise. So we all face situations that should hold us back and what we're up against is bigger and stronger and it's easy to be intimidated and live in fear thinking that we can never move forward but the scripture says because you belong to God you have already defeated the enemy. What's against you has already been defeated. God is not in the heavens fighting with the enemy trying to free you, heal you, deliver you or favor you. The battle has already been won 2,000 years ago. When Jesus rose from the grave he defeated death and everything that can hold you back. He took care of it once and for all. See, the writer of Hebrews says he rendered the enemy powerless. Another translation says he brought him to not, which means to zero. It wasn't even close. It was a shutout. Here's the beauty. Because you belong to God, because you're his child, you have already defeated the enemy. You need to see anything you face in life as defeated. Don't pray for victory. Pray from victory. Father, thank you that I am free. Thank you that I am healed. Thank you, God. I'm forgiven. I'm prosperous. I'm victorious. See, the challenge is that even though our enemy is defeated, he makes a lot of noise. And the scripture says he prowls around like a roaring lion. He's like a lion. He's not a lion. And he'll roar negative thoughts such as that sickness will end me and, and I've made too many mistakes that nothing good is in my future. Do yourself a favor and ignore the roar. Don't believe his lies. When those thoughts come, just give him the zero sign. Remind him, you have no power over me. You've already been defeated because I belong to God. I will walk in victory. I will live and not die. I will prosper and succeed. I will stay in peace in the midst of a storm. See, the prophet Daniel says, the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. When you know your God and what he's done, that he's already defeated the enemy, that he's taken away his power, that he's brought him to zero, you will be strong. You won't be moved by opposition. You won't fall apart when trouble comes. You won't give up because somebody did you wrong. You know it can't stop your purpose. You'll only have supernatural strength, but you'll do exploits. You'll take your family to a new level. You'll break addictions that have held you back and accomplish dreams that are bigger than you've imagined. Have the right perspective. Whatever enemies you face, enemies of fear, depression, sickness, or insecurity have already been defeated. Amen? So I close. And I want to give you an opportunity right now to say, God, I'm going to respond to that. I want to make things right in my life. I want to I've been focusing too much 
on what has been going wrong. I've been focusing too much on what hasn't happened yet. I've been focused too much on what I've done wrong. I've been focused too much on what's been done to me. And, and God is saying, today's the day to move on. Today's the day to move forward. Today's the day of healing. Today's the day of restoration. Today is the day that I'm revived in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'll give you that opportunity right now to make space right now. To say, God, I need you. And if you're in the room today or you may be online today, you think it to yourself, Lord, man, I've, I've gone through so much. Lord, I've, I still have to face this. And you feel like you haven't been able to trust God, but you want to make things right today. And say, Lord, I want to trust you. I want to give it all to you. I'm ready to move on. I no longer want to just run from the past. I, I want to run forward to build towards the future. And all of this starts with relationship. It's a promise that God has given us that we are more than conquerors. For those who believe. So this opportunity right now, don't just take it lightly. Say, God, I'm ready to make a change in my life. So if you're in the room right now, and today you want to begin a journey with God. And say, Lord, I'm all of yours. You want to receive him in your heart. The Bible says that when you receive him in your heart, when you believe that he is the son of God and you confess it with your mouth, you are saved. It begins anew. You're a new creation. The old is gone. There's a new life that begins right now. But it starts with surrender. It starts with obedience. It starts with saying yes to him. And if you've never done this before, today's the day of God. And maybe you have done it before, but man, life happened. You straight away. Church word is backslid. You backslid. You just, man, I'm, I'm not really doing what I know God's called me to do. I haven't really been seeking after his presence, after his face. I, I have no idea where my life is going. I've really not turned to him. I've been doing it all in my own strength. God is saying, I'm here. He's at the door. You just got to open it. Today you want to receive him. I say, I want to start over. And this prayer is for you too. So on the count of three, whether you're receiving them for the first time or today you're saying, God, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to come back and start over. I want you right there where you're at, just lift your hand and say, that's me, Pastor Andres. That's me. Today I receive him. Today I choose him. I, I, I know he chose me, but today I want to make the right decision to say, God, come into my life and start working within me. Everybody look up at me.